had a really crappy day. Yeah, and I wanted to share it with you, but I, then I was like, oh, but you guys are all like so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and everybody's dressed so nicely. So I just want to applaud you for dressing so nicely. Like, lovely. It's so good to see. I'm going to suck in your wonderful energy. Um, so how many people here in the room uh, are working on a social project of some sort now? All right. Um, how many people would like to be? <laughs> the rest of the room, good. <laughs> okay, so I was asked to tell you a little bit about the power of collaboration and what one gets from collaboration and tell you a little bit about my personal story. So um, I thought I'd start with my day. A day in the life of a social entrepreneur. This morning, I woke up, ran my dog, thought the day was absolutely beautiful, gorgeous, embracing the day. At 9.15, my director of operations called me, crying, yelling, screaming at me, basically telling me that we needed to find $50,000 before the end of the day. And then I got bad news that the two organizations that I had been seeking financing for our New York expansion had both come to the conclusion that they were not going to finance us. Then I had to go into a staff meeting where our new team, basically I watched them for two hours reinvent the wheel one more time. So I just want to take a bit of the glamour off this field, okay? Because it was really a crappy day. Now, there are a lot of crappy days. Thank you. I've got almost tears. That's how I feel today. Just a little bit like, how do you get through? How do you get through? So anyway, I'm normally the like positive go-getter, entrepreneur, everybody should change the world. And I just want to say, yeah, some days are fantastic and some days are really difficult. And this work, the reason I do it is because it's, it is fundamentally changing the world. It's the work that needs to happen so that we as a community, as a people, as a country, will actually be able to build a sustainable future, a prosperous future for the next generation. I do this work out of rage. I do this work because we have to find a way to work together to make the world a better place. It's not a vertical or an opportunity, it's an imperative. It's up to us, it's up to you, all of us in this room, to find ways to make the world a better place. So even though you have a bad, crappy day, and you're up against every institutional barrier you can imagine, every bad attitude and every mistake you can imagine, I do this work because I know in my heart of hearts that I am going to go down fighting to make this world a better place. And what my passion has been is figuring out how to get you to. I'm not going to be able to change the world all by myself. One of the greatest frustrations and the rage, the place that the rage comes from in me, is this pure anger at the inefficiency of people who do want to work together, who do want to change the world, and their inability to get along. How many people have had that experience? Thank you, and if you haven't, you will. <laughs> Here's the thing. We all more or less want the same thing, and yet all we see is difference. Why can't we figure out new models to build collaboration so that we can bring the best of our talents, core competencies, passions together in new ways and new models that allow us to transform the world? Why do we allow ourselves to continue to wait for permission when we recognize the power of citizens is for us to take matters into our own hands to co-create the solutions for a better world. Nobody's going to do this for us. It's up to us. Oh, shoot, I was supposed to be watching the time. Who's got some time? Check there. I'm, I'm OK. OK, so I'm going to tell you uh, my story and why and the path that I've taken uh, as quickly as I can uh, to arrive at the creation of the Center for Social Innovation. I had the blessing curse of living through the dot-com boom and bust as a not-for-profit social enterprise. So I watched as the internet emerged. In fact, one of my first jobs was teaching people how to use the internet with a DOS interface. 
that makes me old. And uh, what was so amazing about the internet was that it gave us this incredible tool set. And I was a, had the privileged position of being able to work with over 150 nonprofit organizations where we built some of the very first websites in, websites in Canada. And what was amazing was to see that every single one of these websites needed the same tools. They needed the same things, and they were facing the same challenges. And they were trying to work together, and what they were doing was competing. And I saw the brokenness that existed in the nonprofit sector. And I became frustrated by this, and it became my passion to look at new models to change the world, new collaborative models. I then had the opportunity to work as a part of the Canadian Partnership for Children's Health and the Environment, health, environment, children's organizations, working together around toxics and children's health up against the challenge of looking at consumer products, chem chemical producers, and every kind of industrial byproduct one can imagine in toxic, that creates toxicity. Did you know there's 23,000 toxics that are currently in use in this country and only 89 have ever been tested for their impact on human health? This partnership didn't have anything in common. We found the commonality. And then what we did is we worked with the chemical producers. We worked with the consumer products, the perfume manufacturers, and the list went on, to engage in a multi-stakeholder process, collaboratively, looking at what we could agree on about what we believe to protect our children from toxic exposure. Commonality, core competency. We developed something called the Constellation Governance Model, and we were effective in getting the ban on bisphenol A in baby bottles and triggering a market transformation which has changed the way that we see plastics in the world. We now have the most child protective legislation in the world, in Canada, because of the work that was developed through people figuring out how to collaborate. Today, after six years of work, the Ontario Nonprofit Network, of which I had the privilege of being the founding co-chair, finally got the government of Ontario to agree to not proceed with a broken Ontario Nonprofit Corporations Act. Today, the government proclaimed that they are going to consult the sector and make the necessary changes to be able to ensure that the nonprofit sector can flourish in this province. This is the legislation where we were able to get them to acknowledge the power of social enterprise in law. These are the kinds of systems changes, social innovations, that don't get achieved by one agent. They get achieved by everybody working together leveraging the power of collaboration and the power of networks. When we started the Center for Social Innovation nine years ago, and it was nine years anniversary on Friday. Who had their anniversary? It was one year, right? I was like, one year, nine years, you'll be there. <laughs> we started with a really basic idea. What would happen if we shared? Shared office space, photocopiers, fax machines, kitchens, meeting rooms. Super simple. The world had gone global. We were all super excited about global, 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 and yet we knew something was missing because our heart lives in place. Our heart lives in that special spot, in the way that we relate to our colleagues on a daily basis, the way that we smile at the person who gives us our coffee. That's the power of local. And we could see, I could see this movement back to place. And I had this hunch, and along with my co-founders, four other co-founders, we had this idea of what would happen if we shared. And so we partnered with an incredible real estate developer, Margie Zeidler, who was very much the vision behind the Center for Social Innovation. And we created a shared space for 14 nonprofit organizations. And we watched as arts groups learned from environment groups, learned from multicultural groups. And all of a sudden, the synergy started to happen. We scaled. We knew we had an economy as a scale, business as a social enterprise. We charge rent. We provide private offices, private desks, co-working. We jumped from 14 organizations to 175 in 2007, and all of a sudden, the magic took hold. The power of collaboration became the power of social capital. What could you achieve when you were building ecosystems, building platforms for social change? All of a sudden, the kind of organic collaboration that started to emerge was just invigorating. In 2010, again, looking at the opportunity to take the next step, I fell in love with a building. I do that sometimes. And uh, we fell in love with this incredible building at Bathurst and Bloor, and up against this incredible challenge, what does a little tiny nonprofit organization with a wickedly ambitious mission to catalyze social innovation around the world, but not a single asset to our name? How do we buy a $6.8 million building? Well. One leverages the power of social capital. 
One leverages the power of networks, the power of collaboration to make great things happen. We went to our partners at the City of Toronto, got a loan guarantee, went to Alterna Credit Union, got a mortgage, still had to raise $2 million of our own money and, and created the concept of a community bond, an RRSP eligible investment opportunity for everybody in this room that we could finally find a way to invest and put our money where our mouth is, have our heart lead our investment decisions. And we raised $2 million in $1.4 million in four months, $2 million in eight months, and have successfully replaced some of the larger investors at the beginning. We now have 60 community investors that are owners of community bonds to help us buy and operate uh, the Center for Social Innovation, CSI Annex. So what happens in these four walls is the real magic. It's the community, it's the culture, it's the connections. We start with physical space, we animate the community, and then we help and support our members to accelerate their social enterprise organizations, connecting them with the right people, the right resources, tools, skills, education. We host over 500 seminars, capacity building sessions, and training programs in the space on an annual basis. The idea has some traction, who knew? It was just this idea what would happen if we shared. And then we decided to take this crazy step and to actually bring our model into a low-income community and to begin to test how the power of collaboration might begin to transform neighborhoods, transform low-income communities, mixed communities, communities in transition. We opened up CSI Regent Park last September. We're super excited about the work that we're doing there. It is challenging. It is hard. We're learning a ton. Sometimes it really sucks too. Change is hard. Growth is hard. The reason my director of operations cried, calling, uh, called me crying this morning is because growth is hard. It's not easy. And bigger is better is not always better. That whole concept of scale, I question. It's about impacting the lives of the people that we work with and impacting the lives of the people that we serve and keeping our eye on the game. This is the critical piece. So finally, what's happened is um, we're now opening up our fourth location in Manhattan. I don't know how that happened. It sure wasn't in the strategic plan, I'll just tell you that much. Uh, I'm going on Monday, six weeks. We open up in five weeks. What's really interesting is they are just as hungry for social innovation as every other one of us. It's, it's exhilarating, it's challenging, growth is hard. As we've been growing and as we've been challenged by the capacity issues which are inherent in this kind of a system, we become more and more committed to how we serve and place our members at the center of our work. And for us, that has really led to some amazing, amazing new discoveries. What we've discovered is that we know we're a part of a collaborative consumption movement. We recognize that we are one of many different kinds of organizations that are leveraging the power of this social innovation around collaboration. And recently, uh, about a week and a half ago, we launched our uh, very first online product, if you will. Uh, we launched CSI Catalyst, which is a crowdfunding platform that's available to all of you to be able to launch and raise funds from the crowd to be able to support your social mission projects. We're super excited about uh, this renewed focus on how we put the tools uh, and the power of social enterprise in the hands of people who've got that vision and that passion. What we've learned through all of our work is that it's really about partnership. It's about figuring out how we work together. That really is the thing which can, uh, 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 what do you call it, accelerate the success of your projects and your ventures. So whether you're Olivier with Wanderer who comes in in February and by June has launched a whole new product line in under six months, all from the talent and skills that were inherent in the CSI ecosystem, or whether you're a nonprofit organization that's looking for people to be able to support your website or your fundraising campaigns, what we're doing is we're building ecosystems to support the acceleration of social innovation. I know I'm running out of time now, aren't I? Okay, so I'm just going to wrap it up. Ben, you've got to be tougher with me because I could talk and talk and talk. <laughs> so uh, a couple big takeaways. How do we find collaborations that work? How do you know a good collaboration from a bad collaboration? 
This is my secret sauce, gang. You ready? Know what you're good at. What's your core competency? A good partner is a partner that's clear about who they are, what they are, and what they do well. They have the ability to be good partners to others. The beautiful thing about the for-profit sector is they're very, very clear about what their self-interest is. In the social mission sector, we suck at this. We have so many things, we want to do so many things for so many people, but we're often dishonest with ourselves about what we're good at. When you aren't strong as a partner yourself, you become a very difficult partner to engage with because you're territorial, you don't know which way, you're kind of trying to hedge your bets and go all sorts of different directions at once and you don't know exactly where you're going to fit in or what the value proposition is. This makes for a weak partner. So know your core competency, know who you are, what you want to do, and your strategic vision. This is the first key. Number two, do not be afraid of self-interest. We in the social mission sector tend to hide from that language. We don't like hearing the words, especially in the nonprofit sector, the words profit and, and money, and we're kind of, there's this denial thing. Self-interest gives you clarity that allows you to see where the converging interests are. Open your mind to where those converging interests can connect. And be okay with walking away from partners that aren't a good fit. You will save yourself and them so much time by being clear and being able to say, you know what, I respect you. I think you're great at what you do, but I just don't see a fit for this. Mutual, mutual ability to walk away. I do a whole workshop in Innovative Collaborations. I'd be happy to talk to you about it, but I just thought I'd really just pretty much share what a crappy day I had. Um, it was sort of a bummer, and I'm hoping that the other three speakers can inspire me a little bit, because it's kind of a bit of a downer. Um, I, one of the things that people will often ask me is, um, uh, how can I learn more about CSI? How can I get involved? What kind of opportunities are there there? So I'm going to just do my little pitch thing, because that way you know. Um, look, CSI is a community of over 800 social entrepreneurs in Toronto right now. Uh, we have three locations, you heard them earlier, Spadina, Annex, and Regent Park, and now we're moving into Chelsea. We have a program called the DECA program, and the DECA program is an opportunity for so young social entrepreneurs like yourselves who are looking for access to the community and a place to work. We do an exchange. We basically say, you do one day of service with us as a community animator on the front desk and in our community, and we give you seven days of access to the community and be a part of that for free. So that's your number one, free access to the CSI community. The second thing that we've done is we've just launched community membership. And this is an opportunity for people to participate in the CSI community uh, by uh, becoming members without having access to all of the, um, the physical space requirements. And this gives you access to the programming, the acceleration, and so on and so forth. Um, number three, and this is final, we host a monthly social innovation drinks night. It's called Six Degrees. Uh, you're supposed to have like magic tickets that you hand out, but just you know, talk to people. You'll find out about it. It's the last Thursday of every month. So uh, we would love to see you. And I just have to say, like, I was looking at all the name tags and looking at all the faces, and I just posted on my Facebook page, I am so inspired at looking at the incredible faces coming at me, the diversity of backgrounds, the different, the different perspectives, the different um, uh, skills and talents that you each bring. To me, this is exciting, and it's such a privilege and an honor to be a part of the Social Light program, but really, I can't tell you how proud I am to be an Ashoka Fellow. And if, if Ashoka's job is now to build each of you into change makers, I just can't tell you what an incredible world we are going to have together. So thank you all very much for your time.